Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Welcome to So Many Books, So Little Time. My name is Joe Nash. I'm here with Zena Shevchik. We are both librarians here at the County Library. The premise of the show is very simple. Zena and I go down to the new bookshelf, and we go down to our technical services department where they're processing all the new books. And we just get a whole bunch of new books and bring them up, and we're going to tell you about them. And as usual, Zena will go first. Zena? OK. Um, the first book I've chosen is very uh, timely and topical. It's a book um, about Afghanistan. It's very thick, uh, and uh, so it might uh, deter some people from picking up, picking it up. It's thick and it's heavy, but it's a, a very beautiful book. Um, it's uh, a combination of several kinds of uh, information. It's um, a history of Afghanistan, which has been around for thousands of years in, in many different forms. But it also is a travel log, and it talks about the culture of Afghanistan, and it has stunning pictures in it. And we're used to seeing pictures of Afghanistan the last uh, decade, uh, pictures of war and strife. And uh, this shows beautiful pictures of the countryside. Um, of um, it, it has paintings uh, it, uh, this, uh, showing the different parts of the culture of Afghanistan. It has pictures of some of their uh, ceramics, uh, their gemstones. Um, uh, the, they have a whole chapter in here on uh, the rugs made in Afghanistan. Um, it ha it, it's fascinating. And the, actually, the texture of the book is very appealing. Um, in, this, in this era of electronic books, I was really excited uh, to pick this book up because it's, it's shiny, smooth pages, and it's just the right size to hold in your hand, even though it's, um, it's a heavy book. Um, there's a lot of, um, um, as I said, pictures, paintings, maps. Um, it has a section in the front, which is decidedly a, a travel log, and it has information about traveling to Afghanistan. And it's written by um, several different people, um, most of whom are academics, uh, but they don't write it as an academic. Um, uh, book. Uh, it has a section on security in Afghanistan, what to expect if you do travel there, whether as a, a, a tourist, that seems pretty unlikely <laughs> these days, a journalist or, or some, some, uh, some other kind of uh, reason for you to be there. But um, uh, it's, it's not dense writing uh, and uh, lots of white space, I say, big type and beautiful, beautiful uh, photographs, clear. Um, and, you know, this country has been, uh, well, in many shapes and forms over the last thousands of years. And um, since we're spending so much of our uh, time and talent over in Afghanistan, that I think a lot of people would be interested in this um, book. And it's something that you can browse through. And um, I meant to say about the secure in Afghanistan, the author or editor claims that as of Dece the security information is accurate as of December 2010. But when we turn on the news every day and they talk about the Khyber Pass or the Pushtuns or Kandahar, you know, it gives the history of those areas too, as well as photographs and maps, and um, it discusses the culture of each region. So I highly recommend this. It's Afghanistan: A Companion and Guide. Uh, the main author is, wow, I can't pronounce his name, Bijan Amrani, who is based in England, and he's an academic. But his, the contributors are not, um, are not writing it for an academic audience. So timely okay. book. Does that book cover the last 10 years of history? Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. Well, my first book, this might be a first for us. On, this is show 17. As we speak, this book is number one on the nonfiction New York Times bestseller list. And it is also written by someone who works for the New York Times. 
The Social Animal by David Brooks, the columnist. The um, subtitle's called The Hidden Sources of Love, Character, and Achievement. David Brooks wrote um, Bobo's in Paradise and On Paradise Drive, wonderful books. He sort of calls himself a comic sociologist. Mm -hmm. Not comic, you know, laughing jokes, but he, he tries to tell his stories in a sort of amusing way. The humor way. in our society, humor. the humor in uh, human, the human condition, I'd say. Yeah, so what he's done, he's, he, if you read David Brooks, you know he, he likes to read a lot of um, sociology and psychology research and... Brain science. Brain, and also brain science, that's right. So he's tried to put together what he's learned in the last seven or eight years about all this emerging science um, studies and write it in a way that it won't be just a dry academic. So he, he, he tells the story, he makes up two characters, um, Harold and Erica, and he, he tells their story. It's not really, a, it's not really like a novel or a fiction. Um, he just uses them as just sort of a, to, to, to um, get to all this research. The book has like 20 or 30 pages of um, notes with um, references to all the research, all the studies he does. And I think the basic thrust of the book is, we're finding so much now about the brain that the unconscious is really the heart of the matter, I think he's trying to say. Really, guys, that we think we're rational, uh, you know, human beings and... Making reasonable decisions. Making reasonable decisions, <laughs> but it's really the, the, the unconscious is, has, is, has it all. So he, what he's trying to do is get to all this research and just tell it through these people. You know, like, for example, when they meet, when Harold and Erica meet, you know, he talks about all the studies, all the unconscious studies when men, men and women, you know, hit it off or whatever, stuff like that. And then they, they have kids and they go through their life and school. There's a lot about education in here. I haven't read it yet, but I've been skimming it. So he tries to get into what um, non-cognitive skills, which he says is a catch-all category for all the hidden qualities that can't be easily counted or measured, but which in real life leads to happiness and fulfillment. So... And then one more thing I'll say about it, what he calls, um, what he calls these, these um, non-cognitive skills, and this, this, he, he tries to make this a happy story. In fact, in the beginning, he says, this is the happiest story I'll ever read. But <laughs> he says, this success story emphasizes the role of the inner mind, that's all the unconscious stuff, the unconscious, the unconscious realm of emotions, intuitions, biases, longings, genetic predispositions, character traits, and social norms. This is the realm where character is formed and street smarts grow. So he's saying for achievement, you need more than just getting a perfect SAT score. You gotta have all these other skills and which according to David Brooks and all these studies, which this book is like 400 pages, is really the, is the unconscious is where it's at now. So it's a good look at science um, through the lens of David Brooks. If you know David Brooks, his column, he's a wonderful writer. PBS. He's on, he's on PBS every Friday. But his book, Bobo's in Paradise and um, On Paradise Drive, are really wonderful books. He looks at more of society and th he does a lot of the same things. So. And it's number one this week on the best list, The Social Animal by David Brooks. Yeah, so, you know? I think the, the literary, um, uh, what do I want to say, the formatting of it, uh, uh, creating two characters was fascinating. Yeah. I just read like the first chapter, and I think that it makes dry, what might be dry, sociological, yeah. psychological, or um, even brain science research, uh, palatable oh, to yeah. the average that's, reader. And that's what he does. So, and like yeah, I say, it, there's 30 pages of notes. Every study he mentions is referenced, and you can find them either online or in the... You know. So to figure out what makes you tick. I know. <laughs> I started reading it too. It's really good. I read about page forty. It's it's very good. I I hope. I to, think it's clever. Because I read his two other books that are good. Yeah, clever. So this is uh, my next book is called A Thousand Places to See in the United States and Canada Before You Die by Patricia Schultz, and this is the second edition. Uh, she wrote she pr um, produced another book. I think it was four or five years ago. Let's see, set in 2007, so four years ago. So this is an update to it, and I think it's uh, I thought it was very amusing and also very useful. So uh, imagine a thousand places to see 
in the United States and Canada. A thousand, that's a lot of places. And it covers parks, museums, fine restaurants, hot dog joints, scenic drives, businesses like L.L. Bean, certain traditions. It even mentions certain traditions. It's not just places. She says places. But um, I uh, looked at, uh, I've done quite a bit of traveling in the United States. And uh, he, he, he writes about a half a page to half page to two pages for each, each entry and they're very amusing descriptions of a lot of these places and even some of the places he's choose, he chooses are kind of quirky. In New York for example he talks about he uh, mentions uh, the Erie Canal and then he has a subheading a slow float through history. The, then he met another um, place in New York State is the Hudson Valley Art trail, the ultimate road trip for art lovers. And so it's kind of a, uh, a, dr a drive through or a place to visit along the Hudson Valley if you're interested in art. In New Jersey, he mentions the Duke Farms in Hillsbor Hillsboro. Uh, he said, and the subheading is, a garden state park with a grand vision. I never heard of the Duke Farms. And then in New Jersey also, Rutz hut in Clifton and it's, it's some hot dog joint that he talks about. I never heard of these. So I, I browsed through it and it is, it's very, it's informative. It seems to cover everything and then that you would normally think of and then a few more things in each area. And uh, it's, so it's a reference tool, a planning tool, but it's also something that you can just sit and read from cover to cover. Um, it gives all the details you need to know about visiting these places. But um, I thought it was something Something a little bit different and uh, so I recommend this a thousand places to see in the United States and Canada before you die all right I was going to ask you if there's any around in our area but you yes it covers the typical answer. places like Yaddo Yaddo will cut it in Saratoga Springs okay. and the races and you know that kind of all thing right. Lake George Adirondacks but um, that's all right it. well my next book now Zena we're filming this on Wednesday March 30th now do you know what this Saturday is it's uh, April 2nd <laughs> the day after a big snowstorm no this Saturday is the final four oh so that's I thought, why I, I don't know I thought I would I have a couple of basketball books here I just One, saw that the Major League Baseball starts okay. on Thursday all that's right. enough for me so I got a couple of basketball books. I have a, a one new one and one old one. But the old one, as I've said before in our show, if the if it's new to the library, I, I consider it new. So we can um, it, it's a replacement copy. But I'll tell you about that in a second. The new book is called The Hustle: One Team and Ten Lives in Black and White by Doug Merlino. Again, a book I've I've been skimming, but I read some really good reviews. It is about 1986 in Seattle, Washington, a group of 14-year-olds, um, half were black, half were white, from different parts of Seattle. In fact, the, the opening chapter is called Black Seattle, White Seattle, um, and the differences in the, the parts of the city. So they decide, I guess it was some kind of experiment or whatever, these, these two teams joined up, to, I think basically to see if, because the, the beginning chapter talks about a lot of racial strife back you know, through the 60s and 70s, and so again, this book takes place in 86. I mean, the beginning of it takes place in 86. And so they get together, they combine some, a group of inner city kids who are black with some more suburban, all, all white guys, kids. I mean, they're, all, they're 14 years old, they get together, and they end up playing together and winning a state championship. And that would have been the story, except one of the guys on the team, Doug Merlino, the author, goes back 20 years later, um, in the 2006, I think he's been writing this book the last couple of years, to see what happened to everybody. And he writes about himself, of course, too. But, and from what I've read, from what I've gathered, the book really delves into race and class in Seattle and in America, and the backstory, what happened to all these, all these guys, um, so a couple became very successful, one's in jail, you know, the typical what happens to people 20 years later. And it got really good reviews, and I, like a lot of the books I picked this week, I, I, after doing some research and all, I want to read every single one, but this book looks really good. It's called The Hustle, One Team and Ten Lives in Black and White by Doug Merlino, but another basketball book I just happened to see on our new bookshelf. A lot of times, periodically, we have to weed our old books out because they're falling apart, and um, or they've gone out too many times, or they're, they're books that are, end up being lost. 
and I noticed, here's a brand new book, I mean new to the library, the book came out in 1970, it's a new edition though, um, our librarian who was weeding our sports books took out the original one, it's called The City Game by Pete Axtelm, and it was falling apart, so he bought a new one. So this, this qualifies as new. This is a book I read way back. This book came out in 1970. It's an all-time classic of basketball. It's about New York City and the Knicks of the late 60s and early 70s. If you remember those guys, Willis Reed, Bill Bradley. I do. <laughs> Dave DeBusher, Walt Frazier. Um, and this book is about those Knicks and how they um, came, became champion. Willis Reed, I forgot Willis Reed. Um, and it's also about the playground game in New York. This is one of the first books to write about the playground game in New York and all the legendary players and the Rutgers tournament and the differences between the city game, well, the city game, the inner city game. It was one of the first books to chronicle this and all the guys who were sort of, so at the, who never made it, they, the could have been, should have been, stuff like that. It has a lot of myth, there's a lot of mythology in here, a lot of great nicknames like Herman the Helicopter, Earl Manigault the Goat. And it's all about <laughs> the city, um, the black inner city game. And like I say, it's one of the first books to write about it. A great, great book. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really in the top, you know, a lot of sports books are really long magazine articles. This is truly a great book that transcends uh, the genre. And it's, so you got the two stories going of the Knicks who became champions and their stories and the guys in New York City, the inner city guys who were great and never really made it because a lot of those guys played with those guys like in the summers and you know, you reread this book, why didn't they ever get to make it to the NBA? But they had all kinds of problems. So like the other book I was talking about, a lot of it goes into race and class and socioeconomic things, but this is a really good book, an all-time classic, an all-time classic sports book by Pete Axtelm, The City Game. Zena? Okay, he's sticking with sports, I'm sticking with travel <laughs> today. Um, this is a new book called Ireland Unhinged, Encounters with a Wildly Changing Country by David Monaghan, Monaghan, Monaghan probably. That's how Irish I am. Um, <laughs> he, he spent, he, this is revisiting as well, revisit, revisit, uh, revisitation. Uh, he, this author uh, spent a year in Ireland in the 1970s and he fell in love with the country and he went back uh, to Ireland in 2000 with his family and he lived there for almost a decade. And he's uh, talking about the changes he's uh, seen, he saw in uh, Ireland um, in the subsequent years, but mostly what he's doing is chronicling what the boom and bust of the 1990s and 2000s have done to Ireland, um, uh, what has been preserved and what has disappeared. And one of the things he says that has disappeared are the, a lot of the rural pubs which there's actually a lot of uh, travel literature written about some of the, the pub crawls in uh, Ireland. So I, I just started to read this. Um, it's gotten great reviews. Uh, there are actually reserves on this book. It's written like a travelogue memoir. Um, it's not a heavy book, but um, he's lamenting some of the losses. He's talking about um, uh, how during the boom years, like we in the 1990s here in the U.S., Ireland was going through a, even more of a boom period, real rapid growth uh, in their economy. And then when the bust happened a few years ago, economic bust, it, it's really decimated uh, uh, large parts of the uh, Ireland Irish economy. So he's he's um, chronicling that, but he's also uh, he describes his his conversations with local folk and uh, as well as uh, leaders of the um, some of the regions. So it's written really well. It's very entertaining. So it's uh, it has a lot of uh, current um, current affairs. Uh, topical uh, bent, but it's also a travel log as well. So I, I hope to visit Ireland in a couple of years, so I, I hope I'll be able to have the time to read this. Ireland Unhinged, Encounters with a Wildly Changing Country, David Monaghan. Okay. Now here's a book that I've been looking at. It looks very interesting. Got good reviews. I always, have to, I always say that because I, I try to pick books that do get good reviews. Um, but you know, there's some great there's some great doctors, medical people that are also writers these days. Sherwin Newland, um, 
Oliver Sacks and Jerome Groupman and the guy that writes for The New Yorker, I can't think of his name now, Atun Gawande, I think he say his name. Anyway, this guy's sort of being compared to him. His, his name is Mark Agronin. It's called How We Age. A doctor's journey into the heart of growing old. He works in a nursing home in Miami. And the whole book, from what I've gathered so far, the book is, is a, um, his reflections on the, the aging process, not actually being old. He's talking about the <laughs> process. Well, of course, being old too, but a lot from what I've gathered, it's more about he the process. He describes why our back hurts. Yeah. <laughs> but it's called How We Age, and it has a lot of little, um, it has a lot of little literary references, and it's his own story too, Dr. Agronin's story, why he became interested in wanting to be um, a gerontologist. And it, it's interspersed with stories of the people he takes care of in the um, in this nursing home in Miami, and it, you know I, one uh, one little section I was reading, he he, did, he took he took a seminar once. One of his big heroes was Eric Erickson, you know the guy, the life cycle guy, the nine stages of life or whatever, and he ended up taking a um, seminar with him back I guess in the 80s, so, and it was really interesting. Like he talks about Eric er Eric Erickson was his big hero, and they they ended up taking this. Um, little seminar and then they watched the movie Wild Strawberries, a class, the, the famous Bergman movie about aging. But then I was near the end of that chapter, he when he's doing his internship in a hospital in Boston, Eric Erickson was must have been in his late nineties and came in and he was all the you know, he was he didn't really know him, but so he just reflects on that. So the book is little stories like that, but a lot of the stories are the patients that he treats. And, and their stories in this in this nursing home in um, in Miami, and it looks very good. It's it's got it's, it's divvied up into a couple different sections. Part one is called "What Is Old," part two is called "Old Age Rounds," part three is called "Memory," part four is called "Wisdom," and part five is called "The Million Spark." So it looks really good. Like I say, I read some very good reviews of it. So, how we age. A Doctor's Journey to the Heart of Growing Old by Mark Agronin. Zena? Okay. Um, I'm turning to a piece of fiction uh, called The Paris Wife by Paula McLean. Um, this is on the bestseller list and there's lots of reserves on it and maybe a lot of people know about this book but I just really enjoyed it so I want others who might not normally pick it up to know about it. And it's actually um, a, st a story, uh, it's about Ernest Hemingway and his life in uh, Paris in the 1920s, but it's told from the point of view of his first wife. Her name was Hadley Richardson, and they, oh man, I'm, I'm going to say Chicago, but I don't know if it's Chicago. Where they first met, let me see, maybe it doesn't matter, it's the Midwest. and. Um, uh, it's mostly a story of their marriage and how uh, his first wife um, perceived and handled uh, living with a budding genius, a uh, literary genius. And um, uh, it's, it's so, it's, I suppose women will enjoy this book, but it's, it's told from um, uh, Hadley's point of view and how uh, the literary life in Paris uh, looked to her, seemed to her, um, how insecure Hemingway was and uh, ultimately it's sometimes he was a uh, total egomaniac and their marriage didn't last. Er Ernest Hemingway married uh, quite a few times and uh, this was before anybody really knew who he was uh, but it was a time in Paris, they call it the Jazz Age in Paris, um, when uh, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda and Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas and Ezra Pound and Sherwood Anderson were all a part of a, a budding cafe kind of scene in uh, Paris. And um, it w it's so well written, it's so beautifully written. <coughs> it's... it's uh, <coughs> excuse me, it inspired me to learn more about Ernest Hemingway because even though I'd read a lot of his books when I was in high school and college, I didn't actually know much beyond the myth 
of Hemingway. So this has piqued my interest, and I'm uh, going to go back and read some of his books and learn more about his life as well. So I guess there's a there's kind of a new uh, genre of uh, fiction coming out these days. Someone wrote about uh, Frank. Uh, it was called Loving Frank. Oh, about, Frank Lloyd Wright. About yeah, one of his wives. His there was mistress, two novels about him. Okay, about his wives, about his his personal life, told from the perspective yeah. of people, not him, but people around. Around him, and so um, this is supposed to be. Uh, you know, there's some liberties taken as to the accuracy. Uh, they don't have uh, um, diaries to go to, or she didn't have diaries uh, to go to necessarily. But she. Uh, so there's some liberties taken, but uh, generally the histor the history of uh, Paris at that time and Spain where they spent some time, Hemingway spent some time and where they come from in the Midwest. I know it's, it's Illinois. I know it's Illinois, but it's not, it's not. Uh, well, Hemingway came from, was from Michigan. Michigan, Michigan. Okay. Here, I'm saying I definitely know Illinois, <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> There's also okay. a, been a couple books about uh, a fictionalized versions of uh, with Henry James too. Okay. Now, did, did they use? Oh, they mentioned in the review. They said there's a book about Mrs. Charles Dickens as yes, well. Yes, that's another new one. Yeah. That, uh, that's written as a novel too, I think. It is a whole new genre. Yeah. That book, The Paris Wife, has got a lot of buzz going to it. It's been, it's been getting great reviews. It's sort of a hot book at the moment. Yeah, and I and I say put your name on the waiting list. It's worth waiting. Now, for. do they use the real names? Is he called their name? Yes, oh, okay. absolutely. Yes, yes. Okay, Zena, I have a a little. Test a, little, me? a little test for you. <laughs> this is a new edition of a book that is 1,600 years old. It's one of the most famous books in three categories in all of the Western 400 civilization. 400 A.D. For, for, yes, it's it's at once one of the most famous works of philosophy. Oh no, you can't. Do that. Theology and autobiography. Written in the year 400 or 398. No idea. Sorry. Okay, this is the Confessions of Saint Augustine. Oh well, I know why you know and I don't. <laughs> um, I, I, this is um, a new, a new translation. Of course, the book is 1600 years old. It's not that new, but it's a new translation by Gary Wills. Gary Wills is a very famous American historian. He writes a lot about religion and politics. A lot of his books combine both. A really wonderful writer. If you've never read Gary Wills, really good. What he did was. He, he, he translated the confessions, and he put them out in different sections. There were little short books, I think it was four or five, so there's finally an edition with all of them together. And like I say, it's a very, I have not read it, I was skimming it, I really want, I'd like to read this. But um, it is Joe, one of the most- Joe's a good Catholic <laughs> boy. <laughs> it is one of the most famous works in really in the Western canon, you know, in, like I say, in philosophy, theology, and autobiography. But I, I'm gonna read you two little, quick little excerpts because it, you know, you wonder why would something written in the year 398 still have interest? And I think the, the interest is obviously his, his humanity in, in, um, in telling struggles. his story to his struggles. conversion. His struggles. But just listen to this. This is written in the year 398. Um, the this, this little section is called Schooling. Yet even before my testing time as a young man, even in my childhood, I resisted education and despised those pressing it upon me though they pressed anyway, and good was done, and good was done me, though I myself did no good. <laughs> so that was the you know, interest. And he goes into about being a student. I guess school hasn't changed too much. Human condition. Yeah, and right. I had to read this one other one. Um, again, this is before he converted. He led a life of um, sin, I guess is a good way to put it. <laughs> Stage plays made me ecstatic. They bodied forth my own plight and fed my fires. Why does man happily watch unhappy scenes of woe and anguish, which he would never wish upon himself? Yet he is not only willing to derive unhappiness from these spectacles, but to make that unhappiness his pleasure. So he's reality shows <laughs> on TV today. So, anyway, the, the book, the first half of the book is the very famous autobiography, and then he, the book it ends up going into a book of philosophy and theology of Christian theology. He became a convert. Very famous book in history. You may, I'm sure people watching have heard of it. The Confessions of St. Augustine. This new translation by Gary Wills. So it has a lot of relevance today. It may, yes. It's the point of the story. You <laughs> indulge and then you ask for forgiveness. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this has local interest. Um, it was actually published in 2009, but we just bought a copy now. It, does, it has a brown cover. 
so it doesn't exactly stand out, but it's called Strength Without Compromise. Women, womanly influence and political identity in turn of the 20th century rural upstate New York. Now that's quite a mouthful, but I thought it was interesting and might be interesting to other people because it chronicles the women's suffragette a suffrage movement in um, upstate New York, rural upstate New York, concentrating on the town of Easton in Washington County um, and the formation of the Eastern Political Equality Club in Easton in, I want to say, 1891. Um, and there's two leaders, uh, Lucy Allen and Chloe Sison, Sison, Sison. and uh, it's um, presented somewhat in their own words by presenting the uh, minutes of some of the meetings of the club. It describes how it was formed. I guess Susan B. Anthony uh, at one point taught uh, school in Easton for a year or two and her sister was influential in uh, organizing this club but the author is adamant that she wanted to uh, present the, or write this book um, which was the uh, started as a paper she wrote in college in, 19, in the 1980s uh, because she thought it showed that it wasn't just a national movement for women's rights, women's vote voting rights, but that it started in uh, the small towns and villages uh, of um, the United States. Um, it gives a history of the women's suffragette mo movement and, and where, when and where it started in a national level, but uh, you know, United, New York had a lot to do with it. Stanton and Anthony were from uh, this area and um, the women's convention in 1848 was, oh my gosh, in my brain, Auburn, I want to say, someplace in central New York. Well, Seneca this, Falls. Seneca Falls, yes. Okay. Sorry. And, uh, but this author wanted to, was adamant that she wanted to present the story because she felt that these women were able to um, uh, affect their own uh, futures in a womanly fashion without upsetting the apple cart at home with being uh, very adamant that in maintaining their lives as wives and mothers um, but at the same time working in a very gentle but um, insistent way toward their own uh, you know uh, voting rights being allowed to have their own voting rights and I, it does have um, it's fascinating uh, because it mentions lots of people and places that we all are familiar with in this area so I wanted to bring it to people's attention uh, the w author is from Glens Falls so, and she went to St. Lawrence, um, so it, it, it is uh, uh, of interest to more than just people in Easton. Strength Without Compromise by Terry P. Gay, G-A-Y. Joe? Okay, I have time for one more. Um, this book is called The Memory Chalet by Tony Jute. He's a very famous historian. Some think he's a little bit controversial, but a very famous historian who last, I think, December or November, he died of Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, when he was, when he was um, I'm dying, when he was, the last couple years of his life, he wrote these short pieces that he, he at first didn't intend to publish. And they were on little, um, little um, what's the term, little topics of his own that he meditated on. And they were, some of them were originally published in the New York Review of Books. I remember reading some of them. They're, when you consider the person writing them, you know, someone dying of, 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 um, of Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, in that condition, he really, he only has his mind. You keep your mind, right, it's your body that's yes. falling apart. And um, so these pieces, they're, they're, they're almost like little meditations, but he's, I guess he, the things he picks out to to remember, it's very interesting. He, you know, and they sort of go here and there. They're, they're, most of them are short. They're 10, 15 pages each. And some of them are very moving. There's one called Night, just what it's like to have Lou Gehrig's disease and be up at night and you can't, he needs help to do everything. That's a very, a very moving piece. He has one called the Green Bus Line, or I'm sorry, the Green Line Bus. It's just, he remembers his bus line when he was a, in London as a kid and he just sort of meditates on this bus line and how it was back then in the 50s, early 50s, and then what happened and the city grew, and it's just, it ends up being a meditation on, you know, the 
history and does it say how he wrote it quote unquote wrote it was he capable of writing this yeah I think he smoking? had a thing where he had something hooked up and he could blink and he, wow and um, he could still talk because he did, he did give some lectures and um, different different degrees of disability yeah so this is a collection of many of his little mm -hmm. meditations thoughts most of them are 10 15 pages they're on all, all sorts of stuff ones about he went to a I think he was he, he was on a kibitz a kibitz in the 60s there's one about Paris in 1968. He was there during the student unrest. There's one, there's one about being a you know teacher. Some of them are just about growing up in England and just you know um, one's called austerity, food, car. One's called food. One called cars. One's called go west, young Jew. There's one about his trip through America. One's called midlife crisis. So it's interesting what he chose to write about as he was um, dying. Or, um, and there's, there's, in a way, they're diverse, but they're a way, they're very focused. So, and I read some of them when they were first out. So, very interesting book. Um, one thing about Tony Jute, a very famous historian, when I was when we ordered this book, I noticed that we did not own his magnum opus. So I ordered it. It came out in 2005. Uh, this is just a quickie. I'll let you. It's called Post War: A History of Europe Since 1945. It's a massive book. 800 pages, but it's considered by many to be a great, great history of Europe um, and his, his magnum opus, as I say. So Tony Jute's new book, The Memory Chalet, and then a book that's new to the library, but it came out in 2005, I think, Post-War, A History of Europe Since 1945, also by Tony Jute. Do you want to do one more? I'm going to quickly just mention these two. These are kind of like in the area of how to um, again, because they're timely. The Citizen's Handbook is, is uh, the Citizen's Handbook to Influencing Elected Officials, Citizen Advocacy in State Legislatures and Congress. And um, you know, this is new, and it, it tells you how Congress works and the state legislatures work. But let me find the, the just quickly the the um, the uh, table of contents. Um, how legislators make decisions by the, in their heart in their head and their political health, people who can and can't influence legislators and how they do it. Family and friends have the lawmakers' ears. Uh, legislators pay attention to respected colleagues. Get to them before they take a stand. How to influence legislators who don't represent you. Uh, why online petitions usually fail to influence Congress. How to write letters to the editor that get published and what kind of mail do lawmakers really read. Those are just uh, some really interesting tidbits that people today might be interested in. And then Why Unions Matter by Michael D. Yates. Now this is, he, he's biased because he's an editor of a, uh, a magazine that has a, a labor, it's a labor magazine called The Monthly Review. But I thought today with the headlines about unions being um, uh, attacked uh, across the country that it might the, it, it's a history of labor labor and labor unions in the US and it's a small it's intentionally a, a, a short history so it's for more lay people or people who want to get involved or people who don't um, who, who want to know what the the how unions came about and what they were originally tended to do and it has a section on why they're not haven't been doing so well in the last uh, 20 30 20 years or so so I think this is just topical as well why unions matter by Michael D Yates okay okay well, that is it for show 17 for so many books, so little time, and we'll see you next time.